And all right, we should be working. I see the check marks. And all right, here we go. Does uh, do you have any browser windows open with uh, with YouTube or anything open, Mark? That could be it. Oh, maybe. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, perfect. Uh, Pe yeah. People are filing in, so we're going to get the show on the on the road. Here we go. I'm going to run the intro reel, and then we're going to talk to Mark. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, and uh, we're doing it a little bit later than normal today. Welcome for everyone that was able to join. Uh, we've got Mark Willis here. And for those of you that watch regularly, you'll you'll see the advertisement I run in a lot of my videos. Mark is uh, one of our video sponsors uh, over at Lake Growth Financial, uh, who helps people set up. What exactly do you do? We'll let you take it away, Mark. What do you help with people with? Well, you know, if you need help with uh, plumbing or home repair or car repair, I may not be your guy. I'm working on it, learning something new every day. Uh, but we are specialists at Lake Growth Financial Services, similar to you in helping people take back control of their finances, helping them do it without any undue or unnecessary risk. And in particular, we help business owners and real estate investors help them become their own source of financing, which brings, I think, one of the greatest leverage points in a person's financial life. When you own the the banking function, uh, you're going to have a greater deal of success just by default than if you l lend out or, or outsource that uh, lending function to some banker down the street. So we specialize in helping people take back control of the banking function in their life through several different tools and strategies. And it's what we love to do all day long. And for those of you who have not uh, seen Mark on the show before or have never gone to investigate this, if you if you go to the website newbankingsolution.com, there's uh, basically what we built is a landing page with all the past interviews that Mark and I have done. And there's five or six of them there now. And we go through and talk about what how exactly Mark does this, building this uh, this banking solution that you can use for investing and business purposes. And, and so the reason that I asked Mark to come back today is that you started to sponsor the YouTube channel. It was probably around Christmas time, I think. Eh? It was, it was around December. And so in that time, a lot of you have gone to newbankingsolution.com and you filled in the form for a 15 minute talk with, with Mark and he's helped a lot of you. And so I said, why don't you come back on? and talk to everyone about the kinds of solutions and issues that people are bringing to you from the audience and, and what their solution looks like. And of course, we're not gonna share any personal details that would identify anyone, but um, I think it would be interesting for other people to learn what sort of case studies other viewers are, are trying to, uh, are, are implementing it so we can see what the case studies are. Yeah, it's been, it's honestly what I love more than any financial tool or strategy, better than even watching the the numbers go up on spreadsheets when I build financial solutions for folks. I love the people. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with watching their goals get met. Uh, it's so cool to get to see the stories of people who had a particular concern that they were trying to address and then watching them creatively and predictably meet their objective, you know, without having to drive their car right on the edge of the cliff, which is unfortunately the strategy too many financial advisors recommend their clients do. And they get paid handsomely for it along the way. So yeah, that it's, it's part of what I, you know, I think we are here to do today, which is just to share some of what's happened in the last, you know, six, seven months since we last spoke and um, giving folks, I think some creative ideas of how they could use their, their uh, strategy, the bank on yourself solution. Would it help if I gave kind of a quick primer for those that may not be familiar with this concept at all? Yeah, I think we can do that for maybe five minutes and just, just to give a quick recap of how this works. Sure. I'll see if I can keep it brief. So 
you know, where you put your money matters. It, it actually acts different depending on where you put it. And the brokerage account you have is different than your crypto, which is different than your savings account, which is different than your 401k or any other real estate deal you might have that money acts differently. It just does. It, it, it sort of functions different depending on where you put it. So of all places in the financial universe, I'm, I'm surprisingly compelled by a very old variation of dividend paying whole life insurance of all things. Now we are a full financial firm at Lake Growth Financial Services. And as a certified financial planner, I never thought I'd be talking about life insurance of all things. How boring. However, let me just sort of unpack quickly kind of how this tool can function as a part of your overall financial uh, plan. Uh, and again, where you put your money makes it act different. So what happens when you put money into this particular design of life insurance? We refer to this as bank on yourself designed whole life because it's not the same as grandma and grandpa's old whole life insurance. This particular life insurance has specific design features added to it that allow the money to grow much faster. We're talking eight to 40 times more cash than the old fashioned stuff. Uh, we're talking about commissions being cut dramatically so that we can design it this way. Uh, and it does four things. I'll keep this real brief. Number one, there are some significant tax advantages to putting your money in life insurance. That's been the case for over 100 years. In fact, it was instituted right when the IRS was born in 1913 in the United States. Similar tax advantages in Canada. Uh, so there are major tax advantages, which we can dive deeper into if we have time. Number two, the money is liquid and accessible to us for any reason, and there's no red tape. We don't have to wait for some special age, or we don't have only special uses of the money. We have full access to our cash value for any purpose, for any reason. Number three, that cash value that I mentioned uh, is coupled with something called a death benefit. And that death benefit is obviously going to be an important piece to the puzzle eventually, whether it helps you and your family or you and your business partners. And then finally, the money in the policy that grows guaranteed, by the way, grows on a guaranteed outside of the stock market basis. Every year, it's hitting an all-time record high. How cool is that when bonds are crashing, stocks were failing in 2022, all of our clients were hitting all-time record highs. And, really and to stop that. And just in the interest of disclosure for everyone, the, the reason why I agreed to to allow Mark to be the sponsor of the YouTube channel is because I personally hold some of these policies. And I'll tell you the the one feature that I like the most out of this investing strategy is simply that once the insurance company issues the dividend to your credit and the cash value in your life insurance policy goes up, it just keeps ratcheting up. It can't go down again. And so, um, you know, in some of our past interviews, we've talked about how a lot of people in the investment community will talk about average rates of return, but we, nobody ever experiences the average. You're either having an up year or a down year. And depending on when you start investing and the behavior of the markets in the subsequent years, um, you know, there are periods of time where if you had been investing, you know, the market kind of went sideways for a decade at one point. And certainly if you mm -hmm. invested, you know, when it, when it was at a high and then all of a sudden it went down, you would have lost a bunch of value. And so um, what I like about this is that it you always know where you stand and it only moves in one direction. And so amongst right. all the different, you know, sort of features of this program, I think that's the number one thing for me, uh, just because I don't know when I'm going to retire, if the market will be up or down at that moment. And so, yeah. you know, really that's the risk you're taking when you kind of take this uh, uh, a market-based value investment vehicle strategy. That's so true. Yeah, the literally... We call ourselves financial planners, but if you pressed us on it, if we're building a market-based solution, we have no plan. We can't tell you what the value of your retirement plan will be a year from now or even 15 minutes from now if it's based on things that are outside of our control and have no contractual guarantee. So yes, there's a guaranteed increase of the cash. Now I said four things and I guess I'll give a bonus which may really lend us to the rest of our conversation here today. The fifth bonus feature, I guess you might say, or benefit that I see in this uh, is that when I access this money, I can do it two ways, either a withdrawal or as a policy loan. And mm -hmm. when you do a policy loan, 
uh, you might be familiar with this, David, but for new listeners, the policy continues to compound and grow on the entire value as if there was no loan. Like if I have a hundred thousand dollar cash value and I borrowed out 50, let's say, let's say I borrowed out $60,000 that year. And for all, as long as that loan is outstanding, the policy continues to earn interest on the entire 100,000, not just the remaining amount that I didn't borrow, but the entire cash value earns interest and dividends. Now I'll tell a very quick story to lead us in. It was a gentleman who spoke with me and he had met me actually before you and I officially joined at the hip, uh, but he met me through you several years ago, maybe on my mm-hmm. first uh, outing with you on our on your podcast. But he said he has since set up two large policies, one on him and his wife, and then one for each of the kiddos as well, which we can talk about that. And then he has since used his policy to um, build a $100,000 pool. Those things are not cheap. I'm learning. Big hole in yeah. the ground. And then two, he's used it to invest in some a very large parcel of land. And that allowed him to continuously get several hundred thousand dollars uh, in growth in his policy. Meanwhile, he's still getting the profits and appreciation as he sells those parcels of land to different buyers. So he's subdivided this land up, you know, 300 plus acres, and he's moving that into people. He's selling them piece by piece, getting profit along the way. Oh, by the way, his policy is still earning interest as if he had never done the deal. He had never bought that land. So this is like doing double duty with your money there, right? You get the policy's growth, which is contractually guaranteed to your point, David. But also he's getting the growth and profits off that real estate project as well. Yeah, it's it's a it's a liquidity tool. I mean, it it it's a place to keep your money where it can grow. You get the tax advantages, you get access to it. Um, and to your point about, you know, how it, you know, you say it's you're controlling your own banking facility or you're doing your own banking on your own. Um, it gives you the opportunity to to basically decide when you are ready to to write your own loan, basically, and, and do something. Um, you know, if times get tough and there are opportunities out there, the, it may be more difficult, for example, to borrow from a bank. But with this kind of program, you always have access to that cash. And so for entrepreneurs that have been successful or, you know, and have cash flow and they, they're wondering, what do I do to best manage this money? This is definitely something people should take a look at. This is what I've done. Um, and so, you know, again, it's newbankingsolution.com. If you want to watch all the other videos where Mark and I have, have had conversations about this. Um, and there's a link there where you can book a call with Mark if you'd like to talk with him about your situation. But I'd like to talk to you a little more about some of the other people that have called up. Can you classify the situations people are in into maybe some buckets? Uh, are there any mm-hmm. sort of commonalities amongst what people are talking about? Yeah, sure. There are, I think, sev- several prevailing concerns and objectives that I'm noticing. Uh, and one person that I'm thinking of right now had a major concern, a good problem to have, which is taxes. Hmm. People have this regular ongoing need to pay their taxes. I don't know what's gotten into us. We feel this, you know, this burden to pay our taxes every year. Maybe it's the desire not to go to jail. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, this guy, like a lot of business owners, successful business owners and buyers and sellers wants to pay his taxes, but hates the feeling of losing all that capital every year. And, you know, at least here in the United States, taxes have this funny way of coming around every single year, Mm. right? Probably in Canada too. So what can we do where we certainly lower our tax bill as much as possible? And then how can we not lose a lifetime's work to the government? That was sort of his presenting concern that he brought to me. And, you know, I I put together a, a plan for him and I've got some numbers I could share with you if you'd like. Uh, that would really show this, but his interest was, hey, I, I don't want to just see this money poof disappear. When I send that check to the IRS, I'm watching it go away. It's helping the government retire, not me. So when he stumbled across this strategy and I was sort of sharing how Bank on Yourself really works, his first and initial thought was, wow, well, can't I just use my policy to pay my taxes for me? And this way, he can repay himself on his own schedule. We didn't mention this earlier, but 
you, I did mention that you can borrow from these policies, but you also have control over repaying the loan to the policy that you own. You know, there's no forced scheduled repayment. You know, if you if you have any loan with most any other banker, they're going to require some kind of repayment mm-hmm. plan. In yeah. this case, the beauty here is we've self-collateralized the loan with the death benefit. So this just means, in plain English, this just means that the insurance company knows that you're good for the debt. When you borrow against this life insurance, they know you're going to pay it back someday because either you pay it back while you're breathing or when you pass away, they just deduct it from your death benefit. So... So, so can you, can you, did you have a slide about that or do you want to explain the mechanics of how that works? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I do have a slide. Uh, Let me show the, um, the difference between paying cash for things and continuous growth. And when you're ready, I will share my screen here. So what are the, what are the ways to pay our taxes? Well, one way I wouldn't count this as your, as my favorite way, but one way is to simply go into debt with the IRS. (laughs) <laughs> Not okay, exactly so you don't send any money. Yeah, you just owe them. Don't send. Okay. Yeah, don't send any money in. I don't recommend this, by the way. But many people are late on their taxes, and they owe more than they can pay the government because of a business. You know, how often do business owners end up spending the profits in their business and then forget that? Oh yeah, the IRS is a partner with me in this business, and now I need to pay them. You know, fifty grand, a hundred grand, three hundred grand. Well, they get on, what do they do? They have to call the IRS and get on a payment plan with the with the federal government to pay that tax back over a period of time. And guess what happens? You're in a regular monthly repayment plan with this IRS guy um, yep. sucking profit out of your business like a, a like a vampire. And where does the profits go? Well, it goes to the IRS. What about interest and penalty payments? They're egregiously high when you are on a payment plan with the IRS. Many people live their whole life just doing this over and over and over again. They just live on that payment plan with the IRS or credit cards or mortgages. But, but this guy had a problem with taxes. Most of us, hopefully most of us here pay our quarterly taxes here in the United States. Anyway, generally we'll pay our quarterlies or pay annually at least. And how do we do that? Well, we write a check from our checking account or savings account or whatever we pull from our brokerage accounts maybe. And every time we do this, basically we're saving and then spending saving and then spending. And notice how much interest do we earn on the money after we take it out of our bank accounts to pay those taxes? Well, nothing. well it's gone. So you're not earning anything. Exactly. And when you're, and you're making these prepayments to the government, they're not going to pay you interest on those balances that, that you're accruing with them either. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we've, we've really shortchanged ourselves. But let's say you, you owed a hundred grand in taxes to the government this year. Well, the real that was the sticker price was a hundred grand. That's basically your your uh, uh, your citizenship fee for being a you know a good citizen is paying that hundred grand. But the real cost of that tax bill is whatever one hundred thousand dollars would have grown to to over your lifetime had you not had the tax bill and just left that money invest instead. So what if there was a way where you could actually continuously grow your money and borrow against it? even while it continued to compound. This is, I think, the best way to make any major purchase, including our taxes, especially things like our taxes. Things that happen every single year are typically the most expensive ways to do it. So okay. we've talked about, you know, can you borrow from 401k? Yes, you can. What about a home equity line of credit? Yes, you can. What about borrowing from a bank? Yes, you can do that. All of them have major drawbacks. Any guesses on what some of the drawbacks are for each of these, David? Yeah, well, if you take money out of a registered retirement account, you're going to face some kind of withholding taxes. And uh, out of HELOCs, you're going to, you know, face interest, bank loans, same thing. Yep, yep. In fact, a lot of people will borrow from their 401k and think that that's free money, but actually, that's that's one of the worst ways you can access money. And I'll quickly explain before we move on. When you get a 401k loan, I bet you it's similar in Canada. Generally speaking, the 401k provider requires a repayment with after-tax money. So I, I repay my, I get a, a loan from the 401k, let's say it's 50 grand. And now I'm forced to repay on their schedule at 500 bucks a month for the next several years. Okay. 500, 600 bucks a month. That money comes out of my after-tax paycheck and it goes where? Back into the 401k where it's tax deferred. Mm-hmm. And then in retirement, 
they're going to tax you again on that same money. Yuck. So that's like double taxation. So anyway, home equity lines of credit, bank loans, not much does this, but high cash value dividend paying whole life insurance. As we mentioned, it grows guaranteed every year. Dividends can be paid if the company's profitable. I like to work with companies that have never missed a dividend in 100 years. The loan feature is built right into the contract. They really can't turn you down. There's no background checks to get access to the money. And as I said, when you borrow, it'll continue to grow as if you never touched a dime of the money. So we're referring mm -hmm. to this specifically as bank on yourself type policies. I'm going to skip most of this, but there are a ton of tax advantages to using life insurance. And you can take a look at that and take a screenshot if you want to, but we won't get into all this today. All right. So here's, here's the guy I wanted to take a minute and just sort of show how this works. So, okay. Here's Tommy taxpayer. I changed his name, obviously. And he's got a $90,000 a year tax problem. All right. Every single year, he's got to pay that 90 grand to the IRS. He also said he could save about 50 grand a year for his retirement. 50 grand a year goes to saving and retirement. 90 grand a year goes to the IRS. What we decided as a result of our conversations, did a full financial analysis with him. We decided to take that 50 grand and 90 grand and mash them together as premium. And that's what we're seeing okay. here. He's 45 years old. 90 plus 50 is 140,000. So we're looking at $140,000 in premium here in the first year. And then he starts to take tax loan, loans for his taxes right here, starting in year two. And notice his cash value continues to build even so, even though he's taken a loan and not paying it back for years and years and years, 20 years go by, no loans are repaid, right? Look at that loan balance just growing like crazy. Nobody's forced. So, so this is just, this is just a one time event or is he taking another loan every year every year he takes a new loan because new new taxes are owed every year his business okay. in this hypothetical here so I mean, he, so this is the loan know. in the loan balance column we see that it's growing every year by by the uh, another ninety thousand, and then there's there's interest on that too that's right yeah as you can okay. see the loan is growing with interest each year that he doesn't repay it i don't recommend folks go 20 years without repaying the loan we'll get to that in a minute but here's a guy who went 20 years and he doesn't know. The truth is when I sat down and talked to him, he doesn't know how his business is going to perform. So he doesn't know if he'll ever be able to pay off the loan. He thinks he can with the prospects of his business and businesses. Uh, so as he builds this business, he hopefully will be able to pay down the loan. But in this, in this particular weather forecast, we're just taking a loan every year and continuing to save for retirement and taxes at the same time. He was going to have to save for his taxes somewhere. So right. we decided to put that savings into a policy rather than in a savings account. Now, as you can see, by uh, age 65, he's got $1.2 million in cash value and a $5.8 million death benefit, even though he's got that mega loan against it. So if he should pass, the loan would be netted out, cleared out, cleared away. And the remaining amount, five point eight million, would be paid to the family. So and they get three million dollars. It'd get five point eight million. That's the net death benefit. There is after the loan is oh, factored in. That's yeah. net after the loan. Absolutely. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So remember, okay. he was having to save for retirement, and he he was able to do that. He's got one point two million for his tax free retirement there. If he never paid off this loan. Now, some people are always getting uh, heartburn about these loans. You know, what about those policy loans? Remember, the cash value continues to grow. However, you still get to recapture the interest you'd otherwise pay to the banks. So let's take a look at this. Here's the same story, same example, where he's putting 140 grand in. And then every five years, <clears throat> he comes up with a windfall. Now, his particular business, he... He's planning to cash out and do some refinances and being bought out uh, through some of his business dealings that he does. So he expects every five years or so, he'll have a windfall where he can wipe clean that loan balance. And if you notice there in year six, he has this large repayment of almost 500 grand. Okay. And that frees up the money. And then he just recycles the money over and over again. Again, paying his taxes for five years, finally repays that loan. At year 20, instead of having just 1.2 million in cash value, 
and 5.8 million in death benefit. Notice his cash value is 4.1 million bucks and an $8.6 million death benefit there. Wow. This is all from just saving and paying your taxes by other means. You know, what if all of our major purchases were done this way? Well, I mean, this is incredible because it's basically what's happening is the the amount of money going into the policy is is growing this nest egg that can grow with with the earnings from the insurance company. And even with all these withdrawals he's making, these policy loans, he still ends up way further ahead than if he had just paid his taxes and saved the 50 grand a year. If you had just thrown 90 grand, what's 90,000 times 20 years? Do you have a quick calculation on that? I guess 1.8 million. Yeah. Okay. Wow. 90,000 times 20, 1.8 million. Where did that money go? You know, that's just poof gone in some, you know, filing cabinet at the IRS. But if you could just put that money through a policy first and then use it for major purchases, smartly repaying the loan like this guy does every five years is a smarter move, of course, than just letting it balloon like that. But man, what a great way to save and pay your tax bill. So that's that's my first story is this, uh, we'll call him Tommy Taxpayer. Okay. And, and so you're talking about major purchases. What would be some of the other common scenarios that people have reached out to talk with you about? Well, yeah. I mean, what wouldn't count? You know, I would say any major expense could be a personal expense, could be a business expense. We've had folks buy businesses with their policy. I'll tell you another story mm -hmm. from a gentleman who met me through our conversations and worked together. Uh, he has used his policy to purchase several franchise businesses in the area he lives. Uh, and the business now, of course, continues to provide him income and profits. And at the same time, He's getting the growth inside the business, the policy as well. It's, uh, he's uh, he's doing mostly like you know service repair for garage doors and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now there's another guy who's got a really cool business model. I'll, I'll keep the details kind of vague just so we don't identify anybody. But uh, he uses he has relationships with veterans and he's got several businesses that work with veterans. And so again, each time he runs opens a franchise, he makes more money. So using his policy to open up that new franchise, to put the deposits for the expenses, opening up the retail shops, all the things that he needs to do to run that franchise gives him more profit. So how many times can he recycle that money in and out of his policy, push it in, pull it out, push it in, pull it out. And it's sort of like a, a, a it's sort of like a parking space for our prop, for our money in between our opportunities, our business purchases and acquisitions, that sort of thing. Um, what else can we use it for? I mean, even consumables like cars, vacations, but I love to see how it works with, you know, investables like um, real estate or other major business expenses or kids college education, you know, these sorts of things that really add some significant spice and flavor and value to your overall financial life. Is, um, is everyone buying these personally or are some people putting them inside their business? Well, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a quick story to that. Was a gentleman who um, had a business owned policy, but before he had this business owned policy, he was running the same way most business owners do, which is using a line of credit at the bank. He had a million dollar mm -hmm. line of credit at the bank and he ran his whole business off that, you know, just operating his sales guys were using it, all this stuff. And then kaboom, he gets the call, you know, where the banker says, I'm sorry, but we're terming out your loan. We're exiting your business. And he had five years to get them that million bucks back. And he was so fed up with the banks. He said, I never want to darken the door of a bank ever again. And so over the next five years, he plowed money. He did double duty. He paid off the bankers, the banksters, and he plowed money into a policy for the next five years so he could have a million dollar line of credit uh, from his policy. And now he operates his business with his own line of credit and it saves him a ton of interest two full-time positions. He had two accountants working just to keep in compliance with the bank. So you think about that, that's two full-time positions adding expense to his loan at the bank that he doesn't have to worry about anymore. He didn't fire them. He has them doing other accounting work now, but now it's not going to 
you know, the bank's interest. He's now using the accountant's minds to help grow his own business. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just an example of how you can own a business owned policy. And I'll just say one more quick thing uh, and, you know, be happy to go deeper if you want. But a lot of businesses use their policies for employee incentives. I just met with another person from our relationship who has a, a business, a really growing real estate syndication business. And uh, they worked together to help fund the uh, the policies that the business owns. But they also got policies on all the employees. Now, a lot of folks are like, wow, that's kind of morbid. Why would you get life insurance on your employees? You know, are you trying to knock them off and, you know, collect? No, not at all. This is owned by the employee and it's a benefit paid by the employer. So a great way to attract or retain key employees would be to get them, sure, get them their boring 401ks and all that stuff. That's just, you know, sort of table stakes, but then something called a 162A plan. That's the tax law in the United States. It might be called something different in Canada, but uh, the 162A, it's called an executive bonus life insurance policy, allows the employer to put money into a life insurance contract designed the bank on yourself way, and then allow that to be available to the employee. The employee uses it the way we've been describing. You know, maybe they use it to buy their kids college tuition or buy their cars. Uh, certainly to invest if you want to in your own real estate as an employee. Uh, and certainly this gives the employee incentive to stick around because they're getting that extra bonus from the employer. And of course, they've got the death benefit coming to the family someday. It's again, it's, it's if we've designed it correctly, the tax law says we can access the money tax free, but they don't have to wait until they're 60 years old to use the money in the policy like they would a you know, a retirement plan or a 401k. It's, it's kind of like creating some sort of pension sort of thing without a lot of the red tape and and other, you know, problems that may come with that. Um, we've got some interesting questions actually that are that are piling in here uh, in the in the comments. Would you like to take a stab at some Let's of these? We've, yeah. mm -hmm. sure. we've got uh, Kevin who says, good evening. Hey, Kevin, good to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, and then uh, your team over not, at Not Your Average Financial Podcast says, hi, everyone. Hey. Um, got a question here from Concise Advice. Wants to know if the repayments on a policy loan are with after-tax dollars. Great question. The answer is just like almost all loans. Yes, yes. After-tax dollars are paying back that loan. The difference between a policy loan and a 401k loan is in the future. When you retire, you can pull that money out again with no taxes due. So it's like a Roth IRA, but without all the red tape of a Roth IRA, no no income phase out rules, no um, contribution limits. In fact, some people refer to this as the rich person's Roth IRA because of these you know, uh, unlimited amounts you can put into them, but they are paid with after tax money. So we never have to worry about future taxes coming down the pipe. Well, but what if the loan is still outstanding when you pass on? I guess, the I guess in that is, case. Oh, go ahead. Well, well, what would it be in that case? Well, the loan, when you pass away, uh, policy loans are netted out by the death benefit. And then the remaining death benefit, which sometimes can still be seven or even eight figures, the death benefits are still left to the families or charity or whoever income tax free. Okay. Um, we have a question here about other jurisdictions. Sebastian wants to know if he's in a zero tax jurisdiction, would, the pol would a policy like this still be useful? What, what countries generally are these kinds of policies able to be created in? Great question. Uh, that is really going to be down to, first of all, save some room there for us. If you're in a zero tax jurisdiction, you might want to make sure we've got room to, to all move there someday. <laughs> uh, but the best contracts I found uh, are in the United States and Canada. There are other com countries that offer something like this, but there are a lot of nuanced requirements including the idea of borrowing and letting it continue to grow. So Sebastian, you're right. I, I would still do bank on yourself type policies, even if all the tax benefits went away because it still grows guaranteed every single year. I can borrow from it and it keeps on growing as if I hadn't you know borrowed from the money. What else in the universe, financial universe does that? And then of course the life insurance piece. So, you know, I, I do recommend 
keeping your taxes as low as possible. And, and I'll just say this quickly and I'll be brief. You can come visit the United States, have a business deal here, have some real estate here. As long as you've got a real reason for being here in the United States and you know many people have businesses or family or something, then you can open a policy while you're here. And uh, as long as you get approved, of course, and then you can live anywhere in the world. We've got clients that live in all, all countries around the world. Okay. And so, you know, who can buy a policy? You have to qualify, right? There's, there's a couple of characteristics or things that you have sort of standards you have to meet in order to be able to do this, correct? That's a great point. Yeah. So it's interesting. Usually things that are easy to get are not too great for us. The default 401k that you get just because you got the day job. That's not exactly always a good idea, right? Sometimes it is. Things that are hard to get are sometimes good for us. These life insurance policies, there's an underwriting process that you go through and there's going to be a health records check. There's going to be an exam, possibly a medical exam. It's all paid for by the insurance company. Uh, but I would say that, you know, you you um, you might not count yourself out, even if you are think you're too old or have some health issues. I've had folks who had some significant, you know, considerations for their health that were not insurable themselves. Just spoke to a guy today, met through our coordinations and our efforts together, David. He had had a, uh, I couldn't believe it, a quintuple bypass. I didn't know that that was wow. possible. Never heard of that before, but uh, it's there. And I thought there were, I didn't know that you could do that. But anyway, thank God he's okay. That was like years ago. And so we're looking to see if he can be approved uh, under those conditions. If he can't, well, guess what? He's got a business partner. He's got a spouse. He's got adult children. He can own the policies and control the money in the policies and insure these other folks. And should he pass away someday, he can leave those to his spouse or business partner, whoever. And uh, he, in the meantime, though, he's the owner and controller of the cash in those policies. Uh, it's, it's, and, and the other thing, too, that I'd like to add is that if you have a health condition that can be remediated, you may not be insurable at one point in time, and then later you may be. So, right. I, and I know I mentioned this in our last conversation, but in 2020, I had cancer and uh, it was all taken care of with the surgery. And I just, you know, recently bought another policy that didn't have any ratings at all on it. Oh, so, wow. Congratulations. Uh, after a couple of years of, of a clean bill of health with, uh, you know, regular checkups through, at the hospital and everything, um, the insurance company was willing to, to do business with me again. So, um, your health is one of the key things. And to your point, though, there are strategies people can employ if there is some kind of health issue. Absolutely. Um, Alan wants to know what the interest rate is when you more borrow money from a policy. Well, great question. You can probably find out if you look at the spreadsheet that I just sent you there. I wonder if there'd be an interesting screen I could share again here with you. Just a minute. I may be able to pull pull one up. Um, here's one. Okay, just a moment. I'll have my screen ready to share. All right. Second. Okay, I think I think I've got what I'm looking for here. Let me All right, up here on the screen. Sure. You might okay. have to zoom, zoom in a little bit if you can. Yep, you bet, you bet. Okay, so what we're looking at here, let me get over here first. Okay, so here's an example of someone who is 65 and had a large lump sum to send into the policy. Now, um, my screen, uh, the way I see it, I'm kind of covering up some of my numbers. I hope you guys can see this okay. And I'll zoom in if I can. So, oh, I'll, I'll oh, move it right like on. There That's even better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this guy... This is something, I don't know if you and I have talked much about, David, but there are some companies that allow us to do a single premium whole life insurance. This allows us to dump in literally one lump sum and no ongoing premiums ever again. Notice he's, you know, 65 years old, drops in the 400 grand. Nothing else is added to this thing ever, all the okay. way down the page. Look at how much cash value he has in the first year. Unbelievably... It's like 300, almost, almost 380,000. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's like 94%, 93% of his money in the first year. 
Why doesn't right. he have and, all and, of it? And the the money yeah. that's missing, this is the insurance premium. This is this go. is against the risk that you get hit by a car or something and 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 all of a sudden the insurance company has to pay out, you know, the death benefit, which is 860. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So literally double what he put in there in the first year. So that's quite the asset to the family, quite a rate of return to you. <laughs> but uh we hope you don't have to do that. So what do you notice as you look down the page while well, the death benefit grows? So does the cash value. In fact, just by the third year we have more than what we put in there in terms of cash value. We now have 411,800 bucks in cash value, mm -hmm. more than what he put in there just two, uh, three short years before. So back to our friend's question, this gentleman decides in the first year, hey, I don't wanna just leave this money in my policy, although it certainly grows and beats my CDs and savings accounts and money market accounts just sitting there, but let's keep this money in motion. So he borrows three hundred and sixty thousand dollars from a multi for for a apartment building syndication. Okay, dumps in three hundred and sixty thousand, and his plan is to repay this over an eight year period to have it paid off by the eighth year. Maybe that's through the full cycle of the syndication deal. Maybe it's through dividends or you know distributions from the syndication. Maybe it's some of all of the above. But over the next eight years, his plan is to pay it off, and notice his cash value by the eighth year is $107,000 more than what he put in there. See that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now he paid some interest to borrow this money. He borrowed 360 grand, paid it back over eight years. His total interest that he paid on top of repaying this amount here was 54,000 bucks. Youch. Now why would anybody knowingly pay an extra 54 grand in interest? By the way, that works out to 2.1% annual percentage rate over an eight-year period there. So pretty cheap way to borrow money, in my opinion. But 2.1 is higher than zero. Why not just pay cash for the syndication deal? Oh, yeah, that's right. My policy continues to grow like I hadn't touched a dime of the money, right? Even on the right. capital I borrowed. And so in the meantime, while I had that loan outstanding for the apartments, my money still grew 107 grand. Now, David, which one is, this is going to be an easy math question. Which one is more? 54 grand of interest paid or 107 grand of interest earned? Yeah. Obviously you want to earn 107, even if you have to be paying out 54. That's right. Yeah. In fact, exactly right. Our, our, our We are to the good. Our arbitrage is in our favor of 53,700 bucks. And so that's the answer to the question. The short answer is it's 5% simple interest at most of these companies right now, 5% simple interest. Since it's simple interest all year long and they only compound it annually in arrears, since it's designed that particular way, and if you want me to dive deeper, I can, but since it's designed that particular way, the annual percentage rate is always going to look favorable. It's always gonna be less than 5% because it's simple interest. And David, if you want me to dive deeper into that, I can, but suffice it to say, we've got cheap ways to borrow money Meanwhile, the policy grows beyond that that interest or, uh, interest paid. Right, and and so I guess you know the difference as far as simple interest versus compound interest is, you you take a thousand dollars out, it's going to cost you fifty dollars for the whole year. Whereas if you took a thousand dollars on a line of credit, you know every month they'd be charging you interest, then you start paying interest on interest, and even though it's the same five percent face rate you would end up paying a lot more than $50 on that $1,000 loan on a bank loan. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 In fact, uh, we've done a podcast on this topic. So I'll pull that up just quickly for, for folks that really want to understand this a bit, because it's a lot of fun for, for nerds like me. I kind of like it. So if folks want to dive deeper, listen to episode 32 of our podcast, uh, Not Your Average Financial Podcast. Mm -hmm. Scroll down to the show notes here and I'll just zoom in on this. Again, this only works if it's truly a policy designed the bank on yourself way. I can't tell you how many times people come telling me, hey, Mark, I've got one of those, you know, whole life -y thingies. And uh, I look at it in detail and it, the riders are missing. The expense commissions are too high. The policy stops growing even when you borrow against it. Gentleman who came through our conversations, he had listened to some of our stuff and hopped on my calendar. He had... $800,000 wrapped up in four or five of these different policies. And he thought that they were designed the bank on yourself way. 
like we've been talking about. But, and it was truly whole life insurance. It had all the right writers on it. Everything looked great, except it was with the wrong company. And that company, when you borrow against the policy's cash value, David, it stops growing the money that you've borrowed against. In other words, if you have $100,000 of cash value and you borrow out $60,000, you're only earning on what's left, the $40,000. Okay. And so so this is the real value that working with someone like yourself adds to this process. It's not, it's not just the riders. It's knowing which are the best insurance companies, which are the ones that are really strong performing ones that have always issued a dividend consistently. And, you know, there's other differences too, between these companies, for example, the, the mutually owned ones versus right. the, the shareholder owned ones, for example. That's exactly right. Yeah. In fact, I don't want to bore your, um, your audience with everything, but we put together a, a really nice, in fact, Julia was kind enough to make this. Um, let's see if I can zoom out. Can we see that? Okay. There. How's that? So this is just a full checklist. It's like a pre-flight checklist we make to make sure that the policy is designed right, the agent is trained right, we've got the right allocation of dividends, loans. All this is the minutia that most folks would care could could uh, not care less about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet they're just looking for something that works. It's a lot like our smartphones. You know, there's a lot of engineering in this little phone here. But for you and me, we just swipe and the thing works, you know? So that's what most of our business owner clients and folks that, that, you and, um, that you and I are talking with, they just want something that works in the background so that they can access the money, design it properly so that it does what they want it to do. Okay. So we're getting here to the end of our time. So I just want to ask you a few quick questions. Uh, how many of the people that you sign up for these policies after five or six years uh, come back to you and say, this was really a regretful action. I wish I'd never done it. You, may, you ask such gr easy questions. <laughs> uh, I've, I've not only not heard that ever, not just with the folks that you send me, man, but anybody in this business. I mean, I got out of a part of the financial world working for a CPA. We, she had to make those calls, you know, it was 2009, 10. Oh yeah. He was making the calls. I'm sorry, Mr. Client. I just lost you a third of your life savings. I did not want that to be my career. And so this has provided me a way to always be given good news to people. It's, it's great news. Every time we talk, we got more money. Congratulations. I, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because a little while ago you were talking about uh, corporate owned policies and um, you know, I probably about 10 or 15 years ago, I first started to run into those kinds of policies on the balance sheets of companies that I was analyzing um, and I'd run into these policies. Sometimes I would see uh, cash value reported on the on the balance sheet, or sometimes I would see a policy loan outstanding on the balance sheet. And I remember I used to, I used to ask sometimes these business owners, like, what's this all about? And some of them would be like, well, you know, it's just some kind of investment thing that we were shown how to use. And, and, and we kind of use it instead of a bank line of credit. And, um, you know, uh, when I started to get put some of my money into these sorts of policies, I started to to talk more about it with people that I would run into. And it was really funny because I started to run into older relatives that I have. Uh, you know, my uncle was one uh, actually last summer when I mentioned this to him. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, I bought one of those kinds of policies when I was 20 years old. And then he listed off all the different ways he had used it over the course of his life. <laughs> And I just realized, you know, there are people everywhere who've been doing this for a long time, but why don't we hear about it in the same way that we hear about mutual funds and, you know, RRSPs and 401ks? Why is it such a secret compared to the rest of the financial industry? You know, what color car do you drive? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> You know, it's you don't a gray. To, you don't even have to it's a gray that. car. Okay. It's a gray car. Well, yeah. you know, the, the red Corvette syndrome, you know, familiarity bias. You know, if, if you are driving a red Corvette, you're going to see all the other red Corvettes. If you um, are driving the, the new Tesla, you're going to see all the new Teslas. You know, there's that there's that awareness that's just cloaking our eyes most of the time to what's going on all around us. That's my best answer. I can go tinfoil hat and say that the government would much rather you put money into a tax deferred vehicle. And they'd much rather you support their stock market. Uh, but I'll take my top hat, or my, my tinfoil hat off and just say, you know, it's probably just we haven't been told. 
And we haven't been told because we weren't taught and because the people before us weren't taught and so on. Back in 1940, at least in America, I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, more than half of all of the the net wealth of the average American was in annuities and life insurance, according to the U.S. Commerce Bureau. What's changed? I can say, are we better off than we were as, as a generation in 1940 versus today? Where we're in in debt up to our neck, and you know we're running personal, family, and national deficits. I mean, it, it just kind of makes me wonder what did they know that we forgot? Mm. Well, you know, what I think the difference is uh, is that a lot of these uh, financial products that are sold by banks and other investment companies they take a cut every year, and so there's a continuous cash flow that they get to enjoy from all of the assets that they're managing and that affords them big budgets to do a lot of advertising and promotion now obviously life insurance agents that do bank on yourself type policies do earn money from it you get paid that how would that be different i i'm guessing you're not taking a cut every year of the money in there no that's a great question we don't take money out of people's accounts i don't charge an asset center management fee for these policies uh, as a certified financial planner professional, I, I want to try to do what's right for my clients. So I disclose all the insurance expenses and costs. I've shown you a few of them here today, uh, but I don't take a piece out of their net worth. I don't need to retire before they do. Okay. I'm paid by, by my company. My company is paid by the insurance companies that we have contracts with. And I, I disclose all the expenses that way. In fact, uh, I did this on a podcast too. I won't you know, show my screen or anything, but we have a whole spreadsheet. It's episode 36 of Not Your Average Financial Podcast. And you can see exactly what uh, myself or one of my associates would be paid if we set up an equivalent policy. And then we compare that to an asset center management fee, just 1% asset center management fee. Not a big deal, right? On your mutual funds, your index funds, your IRA or your RRSP or whatever. And in the meantime, we run it for 30 years. And guess what? the commissions that I might earn is fractions of what the Wall Street yeah. guy or gal would earn. There's a reason why the movie was called The Wolf of Wall Street. You know, there's there's more money there, to be candid with you. But I'm doing well. I'm doing fine. Thank, thank God. We're happy. We're keeping the lights on. We're having a good time. Uh, and the best part is uh, we're getting the good news that we get to share with folks. And as a result, they open up more policies, put more in. So, you know, more money going in means more payment to us. And so it all works out in the end. But the key is if you put your clients first, they're going to refer and it's all going to typically work out in the end. I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Julia just put a comment in here talking about uh, famous people who've had these kinds of insurance schemes. You know, she talks about Walt Disney and Rockefeller and, and, and a lot of big names. I, I remember I was I was reading this amazing book called Empire of Imagination, and it was the story of Gary Gygax, the guy who invented Dungeons and Dragons. And you'll never guess how he funded this startup of that business. Get, tell me more. This is one I don't know. It was through, through a policy, policy loan from okay. his whole life insurance. Wow, yeah. no way. And I was just I was reading well, the book and I was just like, holy cow, there it is wow. right there. Another wow. example. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. You, yeah. Doris Christopher, she started Pampered Chef. She started with a $3,000 policy loan from her life insurance. She sold it to Warren Buffett. I think it was half a billion dollars is what he bought it for, Pampered Chef. Tyson Foods, they do chicken. You know, they're one of the biggest farms around. You know, they, or is it, yeah, I think it's Tyson Foods. They, they had a, they started their business with a policy loan. Uh, Walt Disney, um, you know, Babe Ruth, when he got signed with the Yankees, put most of his money into several life insurance policies, but even regular, like, you know, folks like the federal reserve chairman, Ben Bernanke, former <laughs> regular folk, right? Uh, he's, he's certainly got an insight into the financial universe as the former fed chair. Uh, but he's interviewed on a 60 minutes interview and he's describing where he keeps his money. Guess where? Yeah. Life insurance, annuities mostly. So he's got all this insight into how the financial plumbing works. And yet, he sets his money into things that he knows he has access to and can control. Uh, it's fascinating. Again, once you have eyes to kind of see this stuff, it's all around us. We just uh, typically are looking for other things. Well, 
this has been awesome. Thanks for catching up with me and for everyone in the audience. Just to remind everyone, if you if you want to have a 15-minute conversation with Mark and find out how you might be able to apply these strategies in your own life, just head over to newbankingsolution.com. You can click a link there and sign up for a, a, a call with Mark. And that's also the website you can go to to see all of our past conversations. And we'll add this one over there as well. Uh, and so you can literally spend a couple of hours over there and and hear all the conversations we've had over time, which have not, not, it's not been the same content every time, guys. We've, we've talked about different strategies and different things and different examples each time. Um, and so if it's something that you're thinking about or you're, you're thinking that might be for you, I think one of the biggest uh, advantages to acting sooner rather than later is that the younger you are, obviously the insurance cost portion of this plan is more affordable. And if you are in a position today where you're healthy, but you don't quite have the money to to execute one of these plans, you should probably still talk to Mark because while you're young and healthy, you can probably sign up for some inexpensive term life policies that are convertible. So if you ever do get into some kind of health problem down the road, you've basically you know, got your foot in the door to one of these policies and you can't be denied later if you have that term policy in place. Maybe maybe we'll finish up with that. Can you give us some examples of maybe how something like that could be useful for someone? Oh, sure. Yeah. Boy, you 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 understand this really well, David. You're exactly right. Yeah. And um, I'll just say there's so much more to talk about. We don't have time today, but the banking crisis, how's that impacting life insurance companies right now? And how's that impacting our abil uh, ability to use bank on yourself. What about interest rates rising? How is that impacting the dividends that are going to be coming through on these policies? So much to so much is happening in this world right now, and yet the more things change, the more things we can more we can rely on things that never change, which is a contract. The contract mm -hmm. is basically the the building block of civilization, in my opinion, and that's what whole life insurance is built on. So to your to your point, uh, yeah, you know you can hold your health as uh, another colleague of mine calls it, where you get some term insurance, relatively inexpensive, a couple bucks a month for most of us, and then just lock in the health. Even if you had the bad news of the doctor, you can take your, your term insurance when you're ready to and convert it to a whole life policy. It's sort of like renting to own. You yeah. know, you rent the death benefit, which is term insurance, that's renting. And then when you're ready, you can convert it Without any evidence of good health, you could have had unfortunate bad news at the doctor and still turn it into a brand new, perfectly designed bank on yourself policy with the health you had five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, and you're off to the races. And so the story on that, there's a gentleman who uh, lives on the East Coast. He's a fishing farmer. I'll keep the details a little vague just in case, but he had some term insurance and he bought the term insurance with the intent to convert it. And he didn't know when the big harvest was going to come in or if it would come in. So over the course of the year, he got the harvest. He had had some bad news with the doctor. He was still healthy, but you know, people age, things happen. But he was still able to convert his term insurance into a brand new whole life policy that gave him all the space to park all the profit from that, you know, resulting seafood harvest. So Easy, simple, took a sheet of paper or two in about a week for the paperwork to clear, and he's off to the races. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mark, for joining me again today. Thanks for everyone in the audience there who joined us and the people who made comments. Uh, and remember, uh, new banking, newbankingsolution.com is the place to go to learn more and to, uh, and to arrange a call with Mark. And with that, uh, we're going to say see you all later. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site at davidcbarnett.com. You'll find hundreds of articles and videos all for free. You'll find links to my books and online courses, and you can sign up for my email list and get emails covering topics that interest you and be notified of new videos.